say something before we start? Or? Yeah. Right. We'll just go. Uh, we have no narrator? Well, we don't have a narrator. Let's jump straight in. It's, it's, Blake, right? it's Blake, right? All right. I'm going to send out a tweet. <laughs> All right, we're wrapping up. This is the last of the day. We're hoping that you have some strength mustered up, and we're happy for those who've been holding out since 9 a.m. this morning. So this is the capstone for today. Um, and we're going to leave you with some nice sounds. But we keep speaking about the why and the way it feels organic, and we kept hearing terms novelistic and Dickensian. But there's a soundtrack. There's a sound to the entire thing in a, in a not merely a soundtrack, but the very sound that emerge from the series. And so we're all here to discuss and to talk about the music of the way, to talk about ways in which it was a crucial and central part of the storytelling, ways in which it might have stubbed our toes, ways in which it moved along melodically and carried along in an entire storytelling. It was a part of it, but also moved it along. And so we're just going to jump right into the swing of things. But first I want to ask, what is it exactly a music supervisor does because you know we're talking about supervising and Good putting point. together the music and having it has been a part of the series but a lot of people actually don't know what is it a supervisor actually does and so tell us what is it you know a typical television series what what does a super music supervisor okay. do hi everyone i'm blake lay i was the music supervisor on the wire yeah. um for all five seasons um so a music the music supervisor is um it, it varies greatly from project to project, but essentially the music supervisor is the person who selects the music and uh, all of the, the source music that's used on the show and is also responsible for licensing and clearing it. So, um, it, you know, it requires um, a knowledge of all kinds of music. Uh, and the music that's appropriate for the story that you're telling. It also, you need to know about copyright and contracts and all those kind of things. Um, I'm going to uh, show you guys some clips from the show that include some different kinds of music and that show an evolution that we went through with the process of the music on the show. Um, because we started out in a different, very different place than we ended up. We started out working in the way that most TV shows work and um, ended up in a much more interesting place thanks to some great collaborators from Baltimore. Um, typically, a music supervisor, um, I, uh, before I became one, I also I became the music, uh, music supervisor on the wire. I learned on the job. I was hired initially to do sound work. Um, and the show, when we all started working on it, it was presented as a cop show set in Baltimore. And <laughs> it was, I didn't even really know what HBO was. I worked mostly on independent features at the time. And um, didn't it seem very interesting? It was like a, you know, do you want to work on, do the sound on a cop show set in Baltimore? I barely could find Baltimore on a map at the time. Um, <laughs> So I was completely unprepared for this journey that we were going to go on. And um, I, was, uh, I had a lot of experience doing music and sound for films, so I knew how to tell stories using music and sound, but I didn't know how it needed to be done on this project. Um, yeah, so a, lo a lot of music supervisors, the idea that people working creating a TV show in the first place in any capacity feel a responsibility to some kind of ethical um, program or to the subject matter they're covering. These are very foreign ideas in the television industry. Um, so I, I, I sat through the earlier panel, which I found absolutely fascinating and um, hope to be there tomorrow as well. But it's, it's very interesting when you come from the television industry and the film industry, basically, and you come to consider this stuff in an academic context. Um, and there's this, uh, I, you know, just the very frame that you guys are all using to evaluate these things is so different than, than the way that people making the television think about it. Um, so, a, a central principle of the way David Simon works is that, and he, I had never thought about this before working with him, he thinks about the characters in the story as being real people or 
having strong relationships to real people. He's representing real people in a real community, and he cares what those people are going to think about the story. And I don't think that necessarily, necessarily comes from an ethical or moral dimension, or that he feels even a responsibility. I don't want to speak for him, I'm just talking about the process. Um, it's a storytelling method. If you're going to tell a story that takes place in a real place about a real situation that we all care about, let's think about how the people who exist in that place, what would they think of this story? Would they find it credible? And that's the, sort of the first tool that we began to use with, with the music, was what would the music really be in this situation? And I'm saying all this to point out how different that is from the way it's usually done on a TV show. Because normally, a music supervisor on a TV show is a person who's just like, well, they have a, a pile of music. They have a library. They have some taste, you know, where the music they like they're going to bring to the show. They have some relationships with record companies. So they have all these other agendas that have absolutely nothing to do with um, verisimilitude or storytelling even, really. Um, and so that's the point that we, we began at. And we got to a, a very different place. Um, anything you want to ask about that? Or, or, or do you want, maybe want to look at this first clip? Yeah. Well, yeah. before the clip, I'm going to ask you know, you know, Jamal and Juan and Diablo. So you're talking about one of the things that was happening was the ways in which, you know, what did it come into think of this? You know, you know what are the impressions of it? And so I'm curious about your impressions. You know, when you started seeing The Wire, when you started watching it, what are your impressions, particularly you know, with music, with things that you... Garnett, did you want to introduce the, oh, the, the, the I, panel I'm here? I'm saying, oh. sorry. So, or you guys introduce yourselves? Yeah. Okay, my name is Jamal Roberts. I'm from Dark Room Productions. I'm Juan Donovan from Dark Room Productions. And I'm Diablo Flames, artist of Dark Room Productions. <laughs> and um, we worked on season four and five of The Wire. Um, initially, I didn't feel the music was correct as far as um, what they were playing in the show, as far as what the characters were listening to. Um, being that we're in the area, that's not what we were listening to. So we didn't agree with it at that time. Um, but they came around and they got it right. So. <laughs> so you worked on what seasons? Season four and five. When did they come around? Season four and five. <laughs> yeah, they got season four and five right. Um, they were playing hip hop, um, but it wasn't the hip hop that was listened to in Baltimore. Um, they were artists that we respected, but we really didn't listen to them as frequently as they played on the show. So, but you know, you have to actually be in Baltimore to know the kind of music that we were listening to. Because being that we're in between New York and Atlanta, we listened to a combination of, I guess at the time, 50 Cent and Little John. Three Six Mafia. Well, yeah, Three Six Mafia. So we, in the middle of New York and Atlanta, so we listened to a combination of those artists. So. Um, I think Blake was, he was picking good hip hop songs, but they weren't um, specifically what we were listening to at the time in Baltimore. Some clips from. Yeah, we got, yeah. Um, the, f the first clip here we can look at is um, um, a scene from the end of um, episode, the second episode of the show. It's towards the end, it's very kind of just. Um, nighttime in the projects oh. and uh, <laughs> and this is how the music would be done on most TV shows um, I didn't know what to put in here and I so I made something I, I, I wrote this music I mean I made it from you know with some loops and some instruments and was like that sounds like hip-hop that you would hear in, in a Baltimore housing project to me mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> In the hole, y'all. Please listen to the music. The jump again right now. Okay, that's cool. 
So the, the other thing, Pete, we've, we've talked about a lot in other contexts about the music <coughs> on the show is that there's no score, mm -hmm. um, which is unusual on a TV show or in a film. All of the music, other than the montages at the end of each season, all the, mu the music in the show has a source in the scene. It's music that's supposed to be integral to the environment that we're looking at. Um, that's another thing that this doesn't really feel that way either. Again, it's just like, this is the way you do it on a TV show. You get some music that sort of feels credible and you just sort of throw it in there. <laughs> so um, so th this is the second episode of The Wire. Um, um, now we're gonna look at um, the second to last episode of the first season. And um, it's, uh, it's a, a a song by Mostef and Talib Kweli, who uh, I was fans of their music, loved this track, was very excited when we were able to license it for the show. Um, it's a great piece of music, but it's not one that you would really find playing in this context in Baltimore, I don't think. Which, again, I wasn't really thinking about that so much at the, at the time. Um, if you're picking me up outside the cut right on Lexa Fulton, I'll be up there at the tent. But also, while you're watching this, think about how we play the music very strictly, the perspective of it is very strictly coming from that car. And when we change shots, the music gets louder or quieter. It's not the music that's just decorating the scene, it's supposed to be part of the environment. Everybody looking at you, this tank's in control, man, for an effect. Cause we develop in the following Get in play like Baby, don't since we want to know that Stop out of carry out So I can pick me up some cigarettes They're going up north Stay loose So Gregory begging me Stop the purchase What you say to me A death supposed to me You know what I seen For in the club You're acting up by it I got the dub Shit, it's too loud Does any unit have the eyeball? Negative 1135. Come on, Rex, tell us where the fuck you are. Okay, I think we, can, we, can't we, could, we could move on from that. Um, so yeah, you, so you guys were saying when you were watching the show. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm a firm believer that music is the soundtrack to your life. Um, no matter what it is that you're doing, there are particular songs that anyone can hear and remember exactly where they were the first time they heard it and things like that. So, you know, just like if a bride is coming down the aisle, you don't expect to hear DMX. Or if you're tooling up for a drive-by, you won't be playing Smokey Robinson. There are just things that kind of get you in the mood for what you're doing, what you're about to do, or just explain the environment around you without even having to talk. So. Um, that was, you know, it kind of stood out to me the first couple of seasons when I watched it because it just felt out of place. And I think that's a great example because I'm a most deaf fan. I, I think he's talented as hell. And Talib Kweli as well. And I remember that scene. I don't think I told you that, Blake. But I remember that scene because they shot that on my corner. That's the block that I'm from. My mother still lives there now. It's North and Bradish Avenue. And no one on North and Bradish Avenue was listening to most deaf right. and Talib Kweli at that time. Right. So although the show was brilliant and the writing was great, the music just didn't work so to say, um, and being musicians ourselves, stuff like that just kind of stands out. I guess the average person probably wouldn't give a damn really, but it really stood out to us, not just being from Baltimore, but like that, you know, that, that wouldn't work. These guys are, you know, getting ready for a drug deal and they listen to probably the two most c conscious rappers <laughs> in, the, in the world, you know? Which so. is also one of the reasons why I liked it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm sure. Like, I'm sure. I, you know, I'm again, sure. personally, like, the people making the television, their agenda is all over everything. And so here I am. I don't, I still, you know, I don't, I don't actually know what people in Baltimore listen to, but yeah. I'm thinking, I mm -hmm. love this conscious rap. It's, exactly. it's mm -hmm. really cool. It's not that right. like horrible gangster shit. Yeah, you know? right. So that like, makes sense. This is like good, you know, I, I, I agree with the politics. It's not, <laughs> it's not misogynist. It's like, let's, and let's get those people paid. Yeah, let's, right. Yeah. I mean, I also, in, I forget if it was season one or season two, I used some African hip hop, which is like, 
radically wrong. Mm. Uh, uh, D'Angelo is getting dressed, and there's um, Positive Black Soul, another it's a mm. band I love. You know, mm. um, Senegalese hip hop artists who are fantastic. <laughs> and I, I, I loved the fact that I was able to get HBO to pay a Senegalese hip hop. Right. Uh, group, you know. So basically, the very, very satisfying. Just Blake's personal library. <laughs> yeah. Of music. I mean, uh, it happens in most yeah. television shows. Well, mo I will and say most, context. most, most music supervisors have a, a less, uh, maybe less interesting conflict, kind yeah. of conflicts of interest. They're just like trying to get money to their friends, yeah. you know. But and um, the so have connections with. I, it's, it's, it's cool that I, at least I wasn't trying to pay myself. I was trying to like pay African hip hop artists. But it's still, it was wrong. <laughs> in terms of the authenticity and the verisimilitude yeah. and supporting truthful storytelling. And so, actually, it was after, it was at some point in season two, David Simon came to me and he said, you know, I'm getting some reports back <laughs> from people in Baltimore telling me that um, the music isn't, isn't correct and I'd like you to work on that and let's start a process of, of thinking about how that works. And, I was very ready to do that and was game and thought it was actually super interesting. Um, and there was a certain point where he gave me a, a CD from DJ Technics, who was supposed to be with us today on the panel, by the way, and um, of, he couldn't because of a family illness. Um, um, but he gave me the CD and I, I didn't know what Baltimore club music was. And it was kind of a crazy looking CD that was like, the cover was like a black and white Xerox, and it had, you know, I mean, it was really like, for me, it was like it came from Mars. I was like, oh, wow, what <laughs> is this? And how would you ever go about licensing mm -hmm. this music? Like, where, where do you, how do you do that? And it's probably full of samples, I, yeah. maybe, maybe not. So actually, let's have a look at that clip, which was, there was something that happened with this, with this one. When we did this, I, I looked at it, and I was like, wow, this has a feeling that is, um, we've gotten somewhere with this idea of, of using the, the real music of the environment that the story takes place in. So this is DJ Technic's uh, track in the party when Cuddy gets out of jail in season three. Be here next week. proud mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. honestly as a fan of the show i just i if i was like he got it right whoever he yes. is turning out me and blake but that was it the the that was a soundtrack to an event you got you know a guy coming home from prison and you're celebrating it you know when the alcohol the boy the weed the women all that. yeah you got it right with a dj technique song yeah be right? more club yeah. absolutely but i want to ask diablo something because they're talking about, on that uh, note real yeah. fast <laughs> Technically speaking, uh, on the criminal side of things, mm. <laughs> um, technically anybody come home from jail and they want some real gangster shit, we can curse, man. Sorry, Just sorry. did. Excuse me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Be yourself. We wouldn't actually listen to the club music. That's authentic um, Baltimore music, but in reality, somebody in the party drunk was like, yo, turn that shit off, man. Put some rap on or something. It's in no fucking club. I mean, honestly, they would have said right. that. Club music is usually played only in the club. If it's at a house party or somebody's family union, you know what I'm saying, or something of that nature, that you might hear some club music or somebody want to keep it nice for the people, but when you're in, a, in that atmosphere, it's just 
uh, pure ignorance, you know, and every song that's played makes everybody feel more comfortable. You know, that's all it is, yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's people like orchestra music, gangsters like exactly how they live in music. So, mm -hmm. so right. Diablo, I have a question for you. Because mm. we're talking about the kind of music that was being played while the series is going on. Who were you listening to? What, like, what was being listened to? In the streets of Baltimore, then what was you know, like, for people who don't know the Baltimore sound? How you describe the Baltimore sound? Um, Baltimore sound got to celebrate. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I could say it got to celebrate all the wrong things that's, that we're doing. Like you know, the, you have to talk about uh, what's the format of dog room? Um, drugs, alcohol, and bitches. Damn, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. My though, mama's but here. Man. We realized we tried a lot of other things in the industry, and we realized dumb down music is. Uh, it's going to be promoted at a higher level, so in order for you to come up, if you're talking too intelligent about things, you're not going anywhere. So everybody pretty much try to talk more dumb down about it, because that's more about what they push in the states within the society. You know, unless you can blow up and get a beer or Tupac or something, you can be more poetic. But right now, trying to save anything, people don't want to listen to it. Trying to help anybody, people don't want to listen to it. You know, I just ride them. Yo, I want to hear that. You know what I'm saying? I just, I just slapped that. Y'all just did that. I want to hear that. You had the best week. What kind of week was that? I want to hear that. That's what they want to hear. You know what I'm saying? The club is going to be like, yo, who listened to that shit? You listen to that? No, yo, who the DJ? Get them out. You know what I'm saying? A girl ever hear a song about fucking before she listens to club music. Unless it's talking about fucking. But, Which most of them do. You know. Yeah. Baltimore is a sick place. It's, but it's drugs and it's music. And music is not above the drugs. It's interesting. Never heard that before. Good point. So we were listening to Three Six Mafia. That's what, we, that's what we were listening to around. That was season three. Yeah, this was yeah. in like two thousand three, two thousand four. That was like um, Three Six Mafia. Um, who else? I mean, we call it gumbo because Baltimore we consider it the top of the south and in the bottom of the north. So. We love New York music, we love Atlanta music, we love Memphis music, and the music that we created, as well as the music that was kind of really standing out to us, embodied all of those things. And that was an interesting time in Baltimore in 2005 when we started on our project, um, because there were seven people from Baltimore City that had record deals. So, you know, it, it, we, we, we got support and we showed support. It was just a great time musically, period, because it was so much gumbo going on. Uh, you know, all these different cities had their own sound and, um, you know, so since this was the only real worldwide representation that we had, we just wanted to make sure that they got our sound right, regardless of if it was ignorant or educational. We just and, wanted to make sure they got it right. And the stuff we were hearing, was this stuff that you were hearing on the radio or this is the kind of stuff that came from the Baltimore scene of the well, rap battles and the... Yeah, the Be More Club is played stuff. late at night on the one urban radio station that we have. Um, so you hear Be More Club late at night, um, but during the day, you know, they play the same songs which at that time, Top 40, R&B, but we don't really listen to that stuff, you know. We either listen to Underground or, and like the young lady said in the prior panel, um, you know, Baltimore is like a southern area, so we used to listen to a lot of southern hip-hop, like artists from Houston and Memphis, um, Atlanta. You know, but it really, the radio, we were really not fans of the radio in Baltimore. Oh, did HBO? It's only one station. That? Yeah, they play the same songs all day, so. <laughs> so how did HBO buy this? You wanted to have a bunch of hip hop, you know, you know that for their, or just for on the ground, not easy for them to pull from their library, not artists they're familiar with? Right, well, again, going back to sort of, you know, the business of making TV that, you, you're licensing music. It's, it, you spend a lot of money on the music for a TV show to license it for all the various uses. And HBO is a is a entertainment conglomerate, um, and they are most comfortable. Their their business is not telling true stories. Their business is, you know, making TV that people will watch and selling subscriptions and amassing intellectual property assets. So. Um, they're most comfortable, of course, when you pass money back and forth between corporations. So you use music off of a major label of, you know, the, from Sony or, or, or Warner Brothers or whoever, and um, it's all, that's the way it's done. It's, you know, business as usual. Music comes from major labels, uh, and if it's not from that, it should be from a library. So um, not to say that there aren't lots of great creative people at HBO and, uh, and who, have back, who did back this show in all kinds of ways for many years. Um, but that's just the sort of business as usual mentality. So 
you go into that and you say, well, we want to look into this idea of licensing a lot of music for the show from local on the ground artists. There's this guy I've talked to, Juan Donovan, who seems like really straight shooter, and I think we could do business with him. And they're like, absolutely not. <laughs> Those people in Baltimore are all thugs and liars. You can't, we can't have contracts and licenses with them. You, you, what are you talking about? I mean, so that, that's just kind of a sort of knee-jerk first reaction that they have. And then you, like, you explain it to them. And I mean, we gradually came up with a process on the wire. And then we also worked in, in New Orleans on the show Treme and took this even a lot further. But it ends up, it turns out that um, working in this way, which is initially motivated on our end, the, the, create, the creative people on the show, our, our motivation is to tell a more true story. But it turns out that it is also good business. Mm -hmm. um, because your guys, for one thing, your guy's music is cheaper than Jay Z's, mm, yeah. in Absolutely. addition to being more true <laughs> for the story. Um, but it also, the, you know, the response, once we started being more truthful with the music, the response in the hip hop community in Baltimore was just so, so great. You know, mm. I mean, people were so happy. And, um, and you guys have told me, I mean, it, was, it kind of became an engine mm -hmm, for, the, for, the, for the music scene there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show that clip. I asked you the other day, what, like, um, so the, the way we originally started working together was these guys made a mixtape called the Hamsterdam mixtape. And uh, in season three of The Wire, there was the open drug market called Hamsterdam. And um, so let's just have a look at that clip. I, I, asked, I asked one the other day, where, at what moment, where did you get the idea to even to talk back to the show um, in musical terms, to make a mixtape called the Hamsterdam Mixtape that was kind of like, you know, the speaking back to the, to the show? On the corner from here. Seats. Yo, we was on our way to Hamsterdam. The man said we don't get no hassle coming in or going out. What's up? What the fuck is Hamsterdam? I can't let you do this. Oh, I got a G-Pack. On the way to the free zone, they did. You know the rules. Yeah, man, and I was trying to tell these people and well, shut the fuck up. Yeah, boss. Got a situation there? I can't believe this bullshit. Yeah, bullshit, right? I told you to shut the fuck up. Yo, man, who gave us your fucking word? You know you did, man. This is some fucking bullshit. You're some fucking liars, man. Carl, will you please tell me what the fuck is going on here? He just said he's on his way. Carl? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's go. So Juan, what was that? Uh, um, again, it was an interesting time in music, and um, you know, mixtapes are basically uh, uh, albums that you're putting out independently without a record label. Um, at that time, people charged money for them. Believe it or not, um, one of the re ways that Fifty Cent kind of built his empire, you know, ten dollars for a CD that he just made on his own, and. Um, you know, the underground scene was so popping as well that people that you didn't even know could walk up to you in a mall and say, hey, look, you know, I'm trying to do my thing. Uh, you know, I'm selling the mixtape and you sell it for $5 and you buy it, believe it or not. Now all that shit is free. But anyway, at that time, um, you know, that was the thing, selling mixtapes, getting money for mixtapes, trying to put it back into your brand. And, you know, Jamal and I were working um, for a couple of years, just selling, you know, uh, moving music and working with different artists and, and we were trying to find a niche. And um, I saw that episode and it just kind of came to me. And I, I knew we wanted to do something, you know, that kind of dictated uh, how much talent Baltimore had as well as the talent that he and I had. And I just, we, I just couldn't think of anything. And the idea of Hamsterdam, we feel like our music is dope. You hear it, we, we hear this word a lot and we say it a lot and it's free dope. So we're gonna make a mixtape. We're gonna get all the hottest artists in Baltimore. We're gonna do all the music and we're gonna give it away for free. And at the time it was unheard of to sell you, to give you a mixtape away for free. As a matter of fact, there was times that we would give it away to people and they would say, it must be 
terrible. <laughs> um, but it was like, no, 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 it's good. And uh, we treated it like a like a flyer for a party. We put it on people's uh, windshields. We, you know, you go and you know buy Barbershop. barbershops. You go get you know hair for a weave. It'd be you know Amsterdam would be right there, and. Um, it just kind of it, it took on a life of itself. It started to grow legs, and you know, I I, I very famously put my phone number on the inside of it, um, and I got calls from literally all over the world. It just bootlegged and kind of you know just grew, and um, Fader Magazine came to, came to Baltimore and did an interview for us, and you know we were so pumped. It was like, man, this shit is really really working. The project was dope. Diablo had the first single on it, which was a song called Jail Flick, and. Um, I'll never forget HBO called me and said, yeah, uh, we want to speak to a Juan Donovan about the Amsterdam mixtape. And I said, oh, he just left. Um, you know, <laughs> leave your number and not, he'll call you back. And I called Jamal and said, dude, we're going to get fucking sued. Yeah. We are going to get fucking sued. This sucks. <laughs> and, you know, but look, I was like, well, we're going to have to attack this, you know, at, eventually so I went on and called them back and they said they wanted to meet me so I don't know if Blake ever saw the HBO office in Baltimore but it was in this old rundown old industrial area I went down there by myself in the middle of the night I swear to God I thought I was gonna get whacked it was pitch black out there it was you couldn't find anything and I walked into the office and these three ladies met me at the uh, elevator and two of them had the mixtape in their hand and one of them had the fader article and I just knew they were gonna say, what the fuck is this? But they both said, hey, can you sign this for us? So I don't think, <laughs> oh shit. So, you know, they just were like, you know, they, they actually ended up being three writers on the, sh on the show and they said, we just think it's amazing that you took this idea that we came up with and turned it into this Baltimore music phenomenon. So now that I knew, you know, they weren't gonna sue me or anything like that, I was like, oh yeah, you know, this idea was just, you know, it was just, it, it came to us and we knew it would work and, uh, you know, we're fans of the show and blah, blah, blah and everything. And, you know, actually I thought that was kind of the end of it, but it just, it kept, it, you know, kept going. Magazines kept, kept calling, bloggers kept calling. And then uh, Blake called me one day. Um, I was sitting there watching an Orioles game and he called me and um, I thought we were gonna get sued again because I didn't know anybody with such a strong accent. So I thought he was somebody's lawyer. But again, it turned out to be a good thing. And, Is this um, one, Donovan? <laughs> <laughs> and after that, it really took off. He said he wanted to license music for the show, and uh, you know, we ended up being in Rolling Stone like two times that year. And um, uh, the New York Times gave us a, a spread. It was it, it just took off. Not and it was great because it was you know a show that we were fans of, our music, and then artists that we really dug in a city that you know we love. And it was all the perfect storm. And it was just awesome the way it took off. And it really helped our career. It led to us doing music for our TV shows for Viacom, scored a couple of documentaries. It, it really helped us out, uh, you know, uh, career-wise. But it just was a beautiful thing. And to this day, um, it, we put it out in 2006. And uh, I had a, a writer from the uh, newspaper call and say, hey, you guys should do a 10-year anniversary. Make it really exclusive and put it on vinyl. And, you know, we'll have this big party. So who's funding this party? But it felt like a good idea, and it's something we're still mulling over. But it, uh, you know, again, it feels good to know that we did something that special. It's that coming. Saying we're going to do that. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, that you know, ten years later, people are still talking about it, and you know, we, all those articles we have framed and stuff, and you know, just started something really, really great. Because as much as Blake feels like we helped the show, we feel like he helped us as as well in the entire city musically. Um, yeah, it did create a scene in Baltimore. Absolutely. For Baltimore independent yeah, hip-hop. the Baltimore music. independent hip-hop mm -hmm. scene just kind of took off, and, mm -hmm. you know, all artists were getting covered in magazines now. You know, it was it was great. It was great. But, I mean, I just want to underline again the reason that whole process happened was because of an interest in verisimilitude and an inter interest in, in telling stories in a truthful way. Um, which is not something that most people telling stories on television and films really concern themselves with. Yeah. But mm -hmm. on Simon's shows, it's, you know, you can watch the process that I went through with the music, starting out thinking, well, ha this is just a cop show and it's just a scene in the project, so we'll just put some music in here, whatever it is. And then this sort of evolution that ended up c creating something that really has a, a, a very different feel to it. Um, that's done in all these other departments and in all these other ways on the show. So, um, 
sometimes people, uh, you know, there's a lot of theorizing about why is the wire so realistic and um, why is it so authentic or, and, and what do those things really mean? But I actually think a lot of it comes from this, um, this idea that those of us working on the show have that when the story goes back into the world, the people who live the story uh, are going to see it, and what, how would they feel about it? And, and not necessarily trying to base the outcome on that, but just, just, just even respecting that idea, thinking, what does a kid on the corner in Baltimore, what would, he, would he find this to be a truthful way to tell the story? And if you ask yourself that question as a storyteller, you end up in a very different place mm -hmm. than if you don't ask yourself that question. Mm -hmm. How did working with Juan and Jamal and Diablo shift? It's fabulous. <laughs> right. Shift the ways, if at all, um, started telling the story. I mean, did it affect the storytelling? Or how, how did the storytelling start moving in different ways because of the new approach of music? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's well, I, I, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, your question isn't, isn't provoking a different answer than what I've already been talking about. I'm, um, you know, the, the music is still, it's, it's a layer on top of everything mm -hmm. else. So I don't think that specifically us working together and uh, the music becoming more truthful truthful is, all of these words are complicated, but I'm using them as shorthand. The music becoming more truthful or acquiring greater verisimilitude or, um, I don't think it affected the story itself. It yeah. just, um, but, it, but it had all these effects, it has these effects in the real world as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. these, these, um, these, these effects from simply pursuing a truthful way to tell the story, it, um, that, that idea ends up manifesting itself in the real world. I mean, we're friends. You guys mm -hmm. had, have had a different shape to your career in the real world mm -hmm. um, the, be, be because of the, the work we all did together. My, my perspective on music and on Baltimore and on the story and on everything was, was changed yeah. by that from us working yeah. together. But it gave you a new shape, didn't you? In the way you started doing music supervising. Oh yeah, oh, completely, yeah. How so? I mean, well, you said some of it already, but yeah, I mean, it just just in in these same ways. I mean, and then we, you know, we went on. We did an, the the Treme that we did after the wire also was a, um, I think, a central motivation for that entire show was to become involved with the music community in New Orleans um, after Katrina and to to you know, so it's, it's a TV show that is sort of like a huge branch of it is like community activism to uh, support the, the music community in, in New Orleans after the storm and help bring them back. And I think it's, uh, it, it re really did help a lot of people there. But in, a, in a similar way, we wanted to tell a truthful story about how music is made and what the music community is like. And so we engaged with that community and depicted their stories and used their music and paid them for it and um, had them be performers in the show. And, so it has a real, um, a, a, you know, a profound effect on all of those things. Were people registering differently, uh, registering story differently after they started hearing the music of Baltimore play, the music that they knew were underground music, independent music? Mm -hmm. In other words, what were the reactions you were hearing in real time after, in, in season four and five, once people started hearing I a think, sound that sounded more? Well, the show definitely, there? influenced us musically after we got the, the job working on The Wire. Um, we did Amsterdam too, and we tried to take a more cinematic approach to the music, and we tried to kind of create our own genre of music and just make a Baltimore sound. So, like I mentioned earlier, we took 808s from the South and mixed like samples from New York, and we just tried to combine everything. We even took our homegrown music like Go-Go, and Baltimore club music and mixed that all up into like a big gumbo for Amsterdam too. And um, yeah, it's like the show definitely influenced us as far as musically. And I think our sound, there was a couple of people trying to imitate what we were doing at the time in the area because it was pretty much an independent sound in our own sound in Baltimore. And they tried to take like Baltimore club music and mix it. So 
it definitely influenced us musically going forward. And I think it did influence the area as well, because you did see a lot of um, wire mixtapes and <laughs> a lot of mixtapes naming, taking characters' name and naming. So, so it definitely influenced the area and influenced the musical landscape at that time. And a lot of the artists, too, it felt great because a lot of them were starting to get opportunity now, because there were um, artists that we were fans of, like Tyreek Leone, who, um, you know, was pretty much unknown, and now he's hearing his music on the show. But thanks to us and, you know, the link to Blake and uh, other groups that we work with, and, um, and nobody ended up with more songs licensed than uh, Diablo did. Um, so, you know, it, again, you know, as from hearing the panel as well as watching the show, uh, you know, being in Baltimore sometimes, it, you know, it, sometimes if you have a really, I guess, creative background, it could feel like a hopeless kind of place. And, um, you know, it feels good to know that we were providing hope to some, some artists that otherwise wouldn't have had that kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a big thing, you know, to just have this art and have this craft. And, um, you know, now someone is paying you for it and putting it on a, on a, a national television show. And, uh, and now you can run with it. Mully Man jumps to mind. He, uh, you know, he just kind of took the ball and ran with it after uh, he, uh, he, and he appeared on the show with his song. And, that, you know, it, because it came on like right at the end of uh, season four, I think. Um, so it kind of stood out. And, uh, you know, same thing with, with, with Diablo. He just kind of had that same energy for the rest of, uh, you know, the rest of the time after that when he would, you know, work on music with us or without us, you know, so. You want to tell us something about the process in terms of working together, how you decided, you know, what music to choose, what artists to choose? Well, Blake made it easy for us. He said, do what you do, just don't fucking sample because he didn't want to pay anybody else. <laughs> no. um, and, uh, you know, that was easy for us. And, and, and again, it's a, it's a chance he took because the first Hamsterdam was, uh, the album we put out was sample heavy. I mean, it was some original stuff on there as well. But again, you know, it, it, we really had, at the end of the day, we're East Coast artists. And that's, you know, one of the, the, the uh, I guess, the backbones of East Coast hip hop was to sample. So it was quite a few. Yeah, I mean, just to explain that for people who aren't familiar with that process, sampling is the, the, um, the process of taking pieces of other music and making a new piece of music out of them, which was very common historically in hip hop, particularly in the 90s. So you would take an old um, James Brown record and take the drums and make a loop out of that. And that, was, that would be what you would um, uh, make your new song over. Mm -hmm. That's very problematic in music licensing because in fact, you have to license the James Brown song as well as <laughs> the song that's based on it. Yeah. So it's one, of, it's one of the reasons actually, hip hop is very problematic in, in television and film yeah. f for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is because a lot of hip hop uses samples and so when you're trying to get the, acquire the rights to use the music in a show, you, it, 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 it's, it makes it almost unworkable. Mm, yeah. So for, that was why for a long time people would just like make something, yeah. <laughs> you know, or use right. library music right. and, um, you know. I don't think Blake believed us either. I think he said, uh, you, you guys can do this same energy and style and feeling without sampling, right? I said, yeah, really, what do you mean really, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And that's what we did. We just went and created a, a huge, because we, we actually was not, we weren't gonna do a second uh, mixtape. Uh, we were just gonna have Hamsterdam, just leave it at that. And Jamal said, you know, put volume one on there so people think we're gonna do another one. I don't, I, don't, I still don't understand. But <laughs> we did that, so, you know, people did think that we were gonna eventually do a second one, and we weren't, but the, we made so much music for Blake, and a lot of it was just so incredible um, that we just ended up compiling and, and doing a second one. It ended up being like a double CD because it was so much music. Mm. But I had a question, you said you were giving, do you, you didn't only give away the Hamsterdam mixtape, the first one, right? You, you yes, sold we gave, those as well. oh yeah. You oh only yeah. gave it away? We just gave it away for the free. first one? Yeah. Just flooded yeah. the whole city That's, of Baltimore with how it. Many, how many copies did you make? Jesus. 100,000. 100,000? <laughs> over over 100,000. Yeah. Yeah. So there were 100,000 copies of the Hamster the whole mixtape circulating in Baltimore. That flooded the made, whole city. Yeah. But it got bootlegged really bad. Mm -hmm. Really bad. Uh, really bad. bootleg was free. I, I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, you get it from the, the real thing for free. But that's some, you, you know, that's some Baltimore shit. Hours, that's some Baltimore shit. Because people were bootlegging and selling it. So okay. oh, we had, there you go. Uh, that's we had a pretty, that's a pretty corner, good hustle. Yeah. yeah. People <laughs> on the corner were making money off of something we didn't even make money off. So of. maybe they were selling it to Blake and David. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. How Baltimore is that? 
<laughs> well, tell me something more about the process. Did you hand up a bunch of tracks to Blake? Oh, did, yes, did, I'm sorry. You right. about scenes? He I mean, really just let us do us, you know? Um, I think uh, it's a testament to what, you know, the, the energy the first Hamsterdam had that he didn't really, all he said was don't sample. That was it. There, there was no, okay, I need this, I need that. And, you know, we, we're, we're the same way. We like to, we make really dramatic music sometimes. We love to tell stories um, within music. So, like uh, Jamal said, we, it, things just had a really cinematic feel. So we did so much that we just wanted to make sure he had enough to choose from. And it made, you know, it, it made a lot of sense when you see season four and season five where the music was placed because we pretty much did something for every possible scene. We, we had it all. So yeah. were you aware you know, of scenes beforehand or? No, we didn't know anything what was going on with the show at all. Yeah, so at here all. was just the, just doing, yeah. But that's, oh, yeah. this is, that's something about how we use music and how, how David likes to use music is that music should never be on point. Yeah. It's like, what, and nothing else should be there. It's like the, the worst thing you can do is be on point. Mm -hmm. So if it's a scary scene where something scary is going to happen, you don't want to put scary music in. Not, not if it's a, not a score, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you, the music is supposed to be environmental. So mm -hmm. people aren't, you know, the... The, the lyrics of a, of a song lining up with what's happening on right. in a scene um, when it's supposed to be just music that's playing coming from a car or a bar, mm -hmm. that we would never do that. Yeah. Which again is different than the way people usually use music in, yeah. in TV shows. They think, oh look, it's so cool, we'll have these lyrics line up with yeah. this moment mm -hmm. when right. this thing's happening. And we just, we just don't do that. We think yeah. it's, it's just more interesting to Again, the music is environmental. It's a, it's part of the environment we're showing. Yeah. It's not so. So for that reason, I w you know the idea that we would have said, oh, we've got this scene where such and such is happening. Mm -hmm. Go make a song that addresses right. the content mm -hmm. of the story. No, that would that would. It's just not the way we tell stories with music. Yeah, absolutely. Now the problem we had with season five after we did season four, and people in the area were aware that we were doing music for the wire and we were all on newspapers and magazines, they would start making songs talking about characters yes. in the wires. Like, no, you right. can't do that. Hate that show. They're not supposed to know this is a TV show. Right. And right. they would just talk about right. characters from the wire. And we even had one artist who remained nameless. He um, did a song called The Wire and gave and submitted it to us. Right. And he was like a known artist. Yeah, very known. And we was like, okay, we're gonna get this to Blake because this guy is known. And he gave us a song called The Wire. And he's like, no, no. This, the Wire doesn't know that this yeah. is a TV show. The characters don't know this is <laughs> right. a TV show. Right. So. And we felt great because we got to work with this guy. Like, he, you know, he's a popular dude on a major record label. And we were like, oh man, this is dope. And Blake just was not happy with the record. And that's when you changed too. That's it. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just like a terrible. Oh, like, I'm the most nastiest, dangerous, drug dealing this music we can find. <laughs> I was like, all right, let's find them. No one's <laughs> and get it together. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, I, and, and that's how you want, you know, when you don't, when you're not doing, like Blake said, when you're not doing a score. Because me, again, as a fan of film and television, I hate that when if someone is, you know, about to make a drug deal and then there's a rap song playing, yeah, we about to sell some drugs, it's <laughs> whack, That's, it's just, it's lame to me. Right. So, you know, uh, that was another one of Blake's stipulation is, is don't sample and don't talk about the show. And to us, that was easy, but a lot of the artists, they just wanted to be a part so bad. Right. You know, every other line was Omar this and Avon that. It's like, dude, yeah. come on, man, it was terrible, it was terrible. Yeah. But we figured it out. Yeah. We figured it out. I guess I'm gonna take over for Garnett right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> can I say something to you though? Um we could, yeah. We could can I say something real fast? fast? <laughs> <laughs> what I know you say John? I said, I'm can not. I say something real quick though? Yeah. Yes. All right, all right. Uh, one thing too about music, we wear our music, even though they talk about from the HBO side, it's like, you know, to make the scene more alive and make people be more into it. But a lot of times when you're from Baltimore and you watch the music, that's why a lot of times certain scenes just to make our skin crawl because uh, if you're a soft person and you're weak, but you want to be tough because you got the clothes on, so when you pull up in a neighborhood, you're going to put on certain music that's going to talk before you get out the car. You might not even press play until you get right there. You know what I'm saying? And you might not even pull off from your car or pull off at all until you got your tape just right. So when they basically see you pulling out, your music hitting the right tune before you make that left off the block. It's like, <laughs> 
It's a story <laughs> thing. So if you pull it up, you go, I'm the slickest nigga alive. You see the bitches on the block, like, yeah, bring it back. <laughs> pull up, I'm the slickest nigga alive. You got the car, you ain't looking at you, talking about that band, what's up? You ain't saying it, but this song saying it. Why you going right. to the bar? You need to sit them bumping out the wall. You come back to drinks, looking at him, all right, sure. That slickest nigga alive. <laughs> That's how we use the music. That's why when we see it, and it's like, oh, we wouldn't listen to no go go to get her. And, then, and I wouldn't want him to, because I'm weak to try to ride me, because this is what I'm listening to, you know, in certain ways. So a lot of times, just like, you know, you got a hot date coming over, you put the right thing on and uh, set the mood straight. You don't throw no wrestling music enough. You, you put the right thing on and get it in the mood. You know what I'm saying? That's why the music is so important. It's not just setting up the thing, it's actually setting up the person. Well, that's like real world music supervising. That's like <laughs> editorializing on your life with the music. And it's true that we all do that, but you would have to stipulate in the story that that was being done. I mean, all this stuff gets so complicated when you, when you, when, when you start to care about, uh, about the, uh, you know, who is the author's voice in this, in this context? You know, where, 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 what is the perspective of the characters? Because it's true that people do do that, right? In the, in the real world, you, you do think, oh, I'm gonna go and do this thing, I'm gonna put, I want this song to be playing. But we try not to do that in our storytelling. You know, we always think if, uh, you know, if, you, if you walked into a bar and the love of your life you was, was sitting there and it was love at first sight, the song that would be playing would be 96 Tears you know, it, it wouldn't be, um, uh, you know, a, a beautiful love song. It would, you know, so, mm -hmm. I, I have I have another clip that I was yeah. interested in showing. That's just because it's a, and it has nothing to do with any of the stuff we talked about. Really, it's just a, it's the um, the montage from the end of season two, that Greek song. Ah, and it's just song. just because I love it. I love that record. And it's um, it's um, I mean, this was a sort of. Here's just another example of, a, you know, storytelling with music and and music supervising. So it's the the season two is the there's all the Greeks are in there, and um, so we had talked about the idea of using a Greek song as the montage at the end of the season, and um, so I spent a lot of time, you know, researching. I mean, a few days researching different Greek artists and songs and. Um, found this uh, artist, uh, Stelios Kazantzadis, who's mm. uh, a, sort of a hero to the Greek diaspora around the world and sings these stories about how, you know, the love for a lost homeland. And, and the lyrics in this song are about, um, I'd written them down, but they're, they're, you know, they're about loss. And um, Efuge, Efuge means she is, she's gone, she's mm. lost. Mm. So it's a, it's a song of longing and, and also it's a song of realizing that you've made these terrible choices mm -hmm. that have resulted in this okay. bad thing happening that you regret now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that one. Oh, and then you All right, man, Vondopoulos didn't come yeah, home. Clip. Maybe he got lucky. <sighs> Say that Double G had the gun, that it was like self-defense or some shit. Think he could walk, Uncle Frank? He could. And for that, they want what? Loyalty. Fuckers. <laughs> Drive. No, it's just me. You ain't dealing with those guys no more. Go fight me and spirit. I don't fucking want you with me, Nick. Go home!
έφυγε την έχω χάσει και γυλό και ρωτώ και τους δρόμους έχω πιάσει έφυγε, έφυγε, έφυγε την έχω χάσει και γυλό και ρωτώ και τους δρόμους έχω πιάσει Απ' τον ύπνο μου ξυπνάω κι όλο σε ζητώ Τώρα έχω καταλάβει πόσο σ' αγαπώ Θα έχω σ' όλη τη ζωή μου βάρω στη συνείδησή μου Για τα τόσα σφάλματα μου που σε διώξαν μακριά μου Έφυγε, έφυγε, έφυγε την έχω χάσει και γυρνώ και ρωτώ και τους δρόμους έχω πιάσει. Did you want to look at that one other clip just because yes. it's fun and interesting? One of the things is the way in, when, in which the music, the actual music, especially the last two seasons, show in, in, in weaving and being part of the story, you know, reflecting Baltimore, you know, sounding like Baltimore. But there are ways in which it was used in the series, in which it's a marker in different ways of whether you're from Baltimore or not, particularly the scene. And so we're going to look at a scene in which it was important to know Baltimore music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, Conley. Mm -hmm. I know we, we skipped over number six. We want to look at number six now. Excuse me, but Yeah. Did you make that music uh, to the actual scene, or did you master edit it to the song? We, t we found that song and edited the images against the song. OK, all right. That's why I, I mean, like you know, what the, um, the editor, I think it was um, Alex Hall was the editor on this, and he, w he would do like a rough version of the scene mm -hmm. and trying it with different songs. And then um, once we decided that was the song we liked, then he would tweak the, the editing of the images mm -hmm. against the song. It was kind of matching, you know, the scenes, was like the, the, how it was switching was almost uh, rhythmic. Yeah. You know, symbiotic with the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Big words and everything. Symbiotic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always me. I'm letting y'all know. Always me. I'm always me. <laughs> You got them sick? Yeah. Let's do it. You're just gonna walk up on them, all right? Snap one. <laughs> you gotta make sure you're from New York first, right? You gotta ask. Ask what? You from New York? Nah, ask a Baltimore question. Some of the New York nigga won't know. What's a Baltimore question, yo? I don't know, like, maybe something about club music. I don't know nothing about that shit up in New York. Huh? Ask him, like, who Young Leak be. I'm shaking it, jiggle it. Or oh, Kiss Young Leak, an artist from Baltimore. Man, I don't know nothing about that 92 Cube shit, man. Man, who gives a fuck, yo? You don't know Mark Clark. The Big Fat Morning Show. You ain't right, girl. The average Baltimore nigga know all that shit, all right? They don't listen to that shit up in New York. This is some bullshit up in New York. Go ahead. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Got a bet going on, man. So. Who's your favorite one on the Big Fat Morning Show, yo? What, your New York girl. Who? 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 Kill that show any day. Snoop, Snoop, yo, Snoop, yo, yo, chill, yo. Sanjay be on the show, too. So maybe I ask the questions from now on, all right? 
then they basically uh, entrap yeah. some poor bastard on a bet, haul in $20 so it's worth basically of drugs. Basically illustrating the idea that being inauthentic <laughs> with music can get you killed. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty important. Yeah, seriously, we get killed. Pretty important. <laughs> the new game show. <laughs> the things change for Darkroom between the last two seasons, you know, the way you handle music. You know, and having worked in season four, in, you know, what, you know, what different did you do approach in terms of the process heading mm. into five? It made us a lot more experimental. Um, we saw, uh, again, you know, sampling was kind of the backbone of East Coast music, and although we pride ourselves on gumbo, doing a lot of different stuff, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're soul babies, you know, so we, we like to infuse that in our music, so we sample pretty Explain often. Explain soul babies. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, coming up in a house that always played soul music. So a lot of people who used to sample the James Browns of the world and, uh, you know, the Marvin Gaye's and things like that, it's because it, it, you grow up listening to it in the house, you know. Um, so we in, I like to infuse a lot of that in our music, but again, you know, with Blake, uh, he didn't want us to sample at all. So it was, we looked at it as a challenge to have that same edge and that same energy, um, but everything be 100% original. And um, it, you know, again, it was another one of those things that just kind of changed our career because now we sit here and we, there's literally nothing we can do. And every genre, we, we can do it all. But that's, you know, Blake kind of brought that out of us because you know, I felt like the guy took a chance on us, and the last thing I wanted to do was let him down, especially at this point, because, you know, the city knew who we were, you know, we were all over the place, and I didn't want to let the city down either, because that would have, you know, that would have sucked to have such a big impact the first time around, and then, you know, uh, the next time around, uh, you know, Blake tell us to jump off a bridge or something, because we couldn't <laughs> deliver. So, um, it, just, it just changed us musically, it made us grow, it was, it, you know, it was, it, it was amazing, it completely changed our career. Yeah, it definitely made us more experimental um, for season five. I don't know if a lot of the, we started using a lot of um, like tribal instruments because we heard like, I don't know, there was some critic said like it's an urban jungle series, something like that. So we just want to use like native drums and tribal drums. I don't know if we, were any of those picked for um, season four or season I don't think five? so, I don't think so. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I know we started to use that just to see if it would work. But like I said, we just made us more experimental and just try to see what we could do to try to twist up hip hop a little bit, so. How did it shift up the sound? Because we're just seeing it so independent and in the in How did it switch our sound? Yeah, the Baltimore um, sound, how did? actual secrets itself that shift in our... It, you know what, it separated us more. Um, people, you, we kind of started to get, dis, uh, you know, a, distinct, a disdain of, of, oh, he, that's a darkroom beat. You know, like uh, we would do music for artists and, um, you know, they kind of knew it was ours because it didn't sound like anything else because we were really experimenting at the time. And... Um, uh, you know, it just it just separates us. And the same thing with with Diablo because uh, you know his music, you know, lyrically was still gutter and street and you know illegal, and his music was still lyrically the same. But the songs themselves were crisper now, and the, you know they they were bigger, and you know that was the growth of the three of us really. So his stuff started standing out more as well. So. It just helped all the way around, but it really made us stand out as far as you know, the music community in Baltimore was concerned and say, you know, look, the, you know, these guys have come a long way. That's, that's got to be some darkroom shit there. Like, that's what we would hear a lot because we were just rolling the dice on so much stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, it all stemmed from, you know, Blake kind of challenging us. <laughs> you know, you're getting strange phone calls from Connie. Somebody want their artists on there. Yeah. So won't even tell you their name or nothing. <laughs> Who is it? We can't tell you. I'm just saying, can you get them on there? <laughs> we had some artists, but we ain't really you know, particularly one on the tracks and stuff. But they had a manager call and stuff. But anyway, it's like, since the high we came up, it seemed like the more the city started to really, I mean, the while you had a, a great fan base. But you got to understand, um, a lot of the people that are supposed to watch the wire was living it. So a lot of times the drug dealers outside when it's on TV, you know what I'm saying? But when the music thing came out, it was like more or less, uh, a lot of the artists that's up the street selling drugs with them was on the track. So they pay attention to the track more. That's making everybody want to see the show more. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so the drug dealers start um, 
bagging up in the house around that time, instead of being outside slinging pills. They were able to sit in front of the TV and watch it. Yeah. So it changed a lot of things, though. But it, it's definitely, you know, from uh, being in the streets or being on Rolling Stones and then being back in the street. I'm not saying like you took a fall down, but you're still criminal minded and still have your respect that you can walk the street. It, it's a big effect on people because you, they sit next to you smoking weed and they just send you on TV. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just like, wow. You know, you're just chilling. And it makes more, it made more people want to be artistic than criminal. Mm. Yeah. Nobody can tell oh, like the opera. Yeah, you rocking, homie. <laughs> hey. We really opened up the questions. Could you discuss the theme song? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, th the song that plays at the beginning of the show? It changed because people were speaking, right? Right. People who were singing it were getting the same drugs. Same drugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the, the, on the, we tried a lot of different things the, the, for the pilot, actually. We, the, we made the first episode as a pilot. and. Um, uh, that song down in the hole just always, it always won the contest. And um, that version of it, the, the Blind Boys of Alabama singing it, that we ended up using on season one, that was just, it just fit. And it was, uh, it had, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's um, very, uh, it's off point in a very kind of David Simon way. Like it has a sort of spiritual dimension, mm. but it's not real. it's not preachy in any way. The, the lyrics are oblique. It's just seemed right. And so then when we got to season two, we thought, well, let's change it up and use the Tom Waits version. <laughs> and then suddenly season three, like, oh, now what? So, so then we had to, for the seasons after that, we had to make a, a new version that recorded ourselves. Um, so. Uh, who is it, um, Baltimore Children's Group? Um, how do you find it's, a, it's a group of, um, I actually wa I wasn't that involved with that. I, yeah. I mixed and uh, the, the, the final mixing of, on that track, but I wasn't involved with the recording of it. It yeah. was a, a group that kind of came together just for, the, for, for that oh, thing. Right. Okay. Um, called, who, and they called themselves Dermage, but it was, uh, it, that was, um, Nina Noble, the producer, knew a, a group of a kids singing group in Baltimore that she worked with to, to do that. It changed the quality of the music that was coming out of Baltimore prior to us and a few artists that had record deals at the time. The music didn't, the quality of the sound, the mixing and the mastering wasn't that A1. So once we started mixing and mastering and we got some notoriety from it, I think the area wanted to have their quality better as far as mixing and mastering and being able to compete with artists from other areas. So. It just stepped the area up as far as the quality of the music and the quality of the mixing. And um, like I said, it influenced people as far as the, um, the mixtape titles. They would, they were like wire mixes and wire, um, the Omar tape. It was all kind of stuff. So, but it did change the quality as far as the mixing and mastering, being able to compete with artists from New York and Atlanta. Can I say something? Sure. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, I think that um, if you, I, I, I wasn't too sure about how you was asking the question when I was saying, um, when you saying about the artistic side about how did it change things. I thought you were saying in reference to, um, was it like, uh, once they wanted to be more artistic and start being more creative and wanted to do music and weren't really selling drugs no more, did it taint their music to start to be more gentle or more positive? No. They just, they just really realized that that could be the biggest criminal in the world in the booth and just don't go to jail for it. So. It, it made it more enthusiastic to speak the same thing they live from because that's what inspired the music they hand. The gangsters, like, oh, I want to get in that, but I don't want to do that. I want to get in the booth and say that now. So, you know, it starts switching in that way, but it didn't change their music if that's what you was asking. That was a really good answer, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we've seen in the last couple of years that now criminals are being dressed, um, their lyrics are being brought in support. Mm -hmm.
Oh yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's how I got famous. I ain't gonna lie to you. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> if I go down the street and I smack the shit out of Sean, I mean, real, we this is the vibe. Right? He's I gonna know, be real. Everybody found it today. Like, listen, if I go down the street and I smack the shit out of Sean, then beat up Kevin, and I fuck fat ass Keisha, and I go out and they got me a pound of weed. I'm sharing with everybody. That's just the moment in the day. Now, if that end up in the booth and it come out and they by jamming, yo, I fuck teens in the smack, y'all, right. uh, and niggas got a pound of weed, and yo, we got it on. Oh, shit, that was just the day. <laughs> it's like, that's all building my own fan base. It was just like, yo, listen, it was like Suge Knight with rap skills, like, Pac. it was like, he really living it, but he's saying it, and he can hear it, and it's just right there. So, you know, when you when you're doing stuff at, at that level, you know, it start changing me. It started getting my own, that's how I had my own fan base, because you had, in, in the city of Baltimore, uh, being popular or flashy is a death sentence. So if you can be popular and flashy plus kick ass and can do music, you're gonna end up blowing up. That's why I'm here today. Mm. So you know, so sometimes uh, things are more effective if you actually lived it and then speak it. And then when you sit back, cause only certain people know certain things, you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, everybody washed their hands before, but you know, sometimes you talk about you take the water, great dry, your hands still got a little soap on it. But the only people who really wash their hands know. So we have certain stuff and certain instruments and stuff. I'm like, I, you know, I shot this person, but I put the gun back in my dip. I had a bubble on my stomach because it was too hot when I was running from him. But only person know, oh, yeah, the bar was too hot. And she put it on the burnt skin. But only if you really did that, something small and intricate. It's not a hard rhyme. It's not a hard piece or, or, or in the vocabulary. It's just how you put that together so significantly that you had to live that to know that. And that make everybody respect you. They feel like they know more about you than you think they do. You know what I'm saying? Because the same thing might have happened to them. They might got six pounds on his stomach. You know what I'm saying? I hear me say it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Relating to you is just the main thing. That kind of also plays to the other part of your question. Um, because that, that line, I know Chuck D used to always say that rap is supposed to be the CNN of our generation, which basically means that what we see, we talk about it on record. And that is this really thin line between are you real or fake? It, it, hip hop is the only genre that goes through that. I, I don't think Britney Spears has ever had that problem. <laughs> um, but you know, we've had that that issue. Uh, an artist, Young Moose, who was signed to Kevin Lyle's label, he uh, right when he started to kind of take off, he got arrested for um, a gun charge, and uh, they and they brought his work they bought court. his mixtape into court and they played his video and showed that he had all these guns in his video and everything and he went to prison for a year you know so again you know a rapper trying to uh keep it real i guess so to say so you know that's always kind of been uh, a thing that you know a hip hop a stigma hip hop has had um but you know sometimes you can be a little bit smarter but that is you know I won't say that we played a part in it, but you know the way music started changing, the bar raised into how real are you, so to say. You know what I mean? And a lot of people have just you know continually gotten in trouble behind that. Well, I think in the short, short and sweetly though, I just think that short to the sweetly. question is just that um, a lot of times you can say what you want, but you can't actually be in court for killing Kevin and then lying saying you don't know him, but on your son, I killed Kevin yesterday, right. I killed Kevin, Kevin on the street and says the address. Yeah, they, that's the type of stuff they can bring in court on. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I understand of that nature, but uh, the, most of the time though, you know, when you're saying what you're supposed to say, you gotta be living in Baltimore. I mean, you really have to live it, because if you're saying you kicking ass, you ain't kicking ass, you gonna get your ass kicked mm -hmm. next show. Somebody gonna do it, because they don't want that shine. If you some little hustle in the street, you're gonna punch you in the mouth, mm -hmm. it's because somebody said you was a punk. You know what I'm saying? And you yeah. lying to saying who you are. You know what I'm saying? So. A lot of times the standard is reality, but sometimes in court, your reality might bite you if you snitched on yourself on music. So. Mm -hmm.